spectral imaging. And today we have a fantastic set of speakers, in my opinion, the four most important space agencies in this planet, and a set of companies who want to help them with their main needs. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the online industry meeting of Optica on hyperspectral and multispectral imaging. The aerospace sector is constantly looking for ways to monitor the Earth. And hyperspectral imaging is one technology that's making a huge impact. It requires specially designed commercial cameras where every pixel is a spectrometer. And this allows us to detect the chemical composition of solids, water or gases from a distance. And I find this amazing. With these cameras, we can monitor deforestation, soil erosion, and water quality from an aircraft. And how about detecting explosives, dangerous chemicals, drug plantations, or concealed weapons? Hyperspectral imaging has evolved from a commodity to a vital tool for many working in aerospace. We find hyperspectral imaging cameras already today in satellites, airplanes, and drones, but there are many challenges still to solve related to real-time data processing and resolution. So on April 25th, we want to bring together the main agencies worldwide in aerospace science, ISA, ISSI, DLR, and Jet Propulsion Labs of NASA, as well as some of the leading hyperspectral imaging camera manufacturers in the world. We have invited Resono, Nireos, High Specs, Specking, Headwall, IMEC, or PLX. Wait, if you were not mentioned in the list and you should be there, please let me know and I would be more than happy to invite you to this discussion. Most important, prepare an answer to the Optica question. What can you do for others and what can others do for you? So here are a few questions that have been raised. Number one, what is the role of super continuum generation lasers in hyperspectral imaging? And yes, I'm talking about Lucos, NKT Photonics, or Energetic, the last two Hamamatsu companies. Number two, how do you optimize the optics and coatings needed to manufacture hyperspectral cameras and take into account that these cameras have to withstand the harshest of environments? outer space. Number three, what can be done about the current price tag and aspect ratio? Number four, what is the wavelength range needed? And I should stop here. There are so many dilemmas to discuss. So join the vibrant discussion on 25th of April at 7 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. in the UK and 4 p.m in Central Europe. Optica already connects the world of photonics. On 25th of April, we'll get the much bigger picture. And we are here getting the much bigger picture. Thank you very much, all of you, for your fantastic support. It's been already one year and about a month since I joined Optica, and I have been overwhelmed by all of you for the new vibe the new action, the new ideas that we need to know each company individually and make the connection between them and the potential end users of our industry. I really want to continue. We are growing, we are hiring, we are really bringing a very strong team here. Today with me, we have Helena Diaz. She's our technical director of laser technology based in Manchester, beautiful United Kingdom. And we have a really good set of companies who want to help address the needs of our industry. We are now growing Thank you so much for all the support. We have reached almost 500 members now. We are really happy about this. But the most important always keep in mind that what we do here is to bring the companies together, connect you with potential R&D lines, suppliers, partners, and customers, give you market reports, and access to places to hire talent. That's the most important thing that we do. Today is uh, a big day for us because we have, uh, this is the first meeting after a previous board directors meeting. We have been supported to continue this activity. This is our council and this is our president, Michelle Lipson. From here, thank you so much for all the guidance you're giving us on building this global trade association. Today is also halfway through our first season of online industry meetings. Today is Hyperspectral Imaging. For those of you in the 
laser industry, many of you are manufacturing lasers and also making optics for the laser industry. The next one is on 30th of May, laser welding. And expect automotive and battery makers there sharing their needs. But today, today hyperspectral imaging. And in a meeting of hyperspectral imaging, the most important thing we wanted to do is to focus on one of the most important application fields. So we went to the aerospace sector and we contacted ISA. I live in North Bike here. So behind this screen screen is the European Space Agency. Thank you, Luca, for being here. But we also contacted Jet Propulsion Labs. We contacted NASA, Robert Green, who has been for many years very engaged with Optica on different events. And we also wanted to have other other space agencies and aerospace around this sector. So we brought DLR, the German Aerospace Center, and ISSI, represented by Michael Rust. But that's not all. That's not all. We contacted our members and we asked them for feedback. We asked them, what do you do for LiDAR? And these are the companies who respond positively and they register for the meeting. What we did is to study each company individually and see what role they would make in a supply chain for hyperspectral imaging manufacturing. This is the result from the optics made by Iridia all the way to the cameras made by Horiva. We have separated the companies because the purpose is to separate you, to identify your unique selling point, and afterwards, bringing together, of course, we will publish this slide everywhere to make sure that any company registered today gets the visibility as as a clear role in the supply chain. I would like to remind everyone that we also provide you with market reports, optical.org-market reports. Everyone who's a corporate member has a long list of market reports fully available there. Please have a look at them. And most important, this meeting is also live streaming YouTube. So let me say hello to the YouTubers. Hello, YouTubers of the world. Thank you very much for being with us. Please, if you have any question, write them in the chat and I will read it in the room. But let me go back to the Zoom room. This is so valid for the people in the Zoom room. If you have any question, you can write it in the chat and we will make sure that it's voiced. But most important, this is a cooperation meeting. Please keep your camera on at all times. And please, whenever you have a question, voice it yourself. The purpose of this meeting, this is not a webinar. You didn't come here to listen. You came here to speak. These are two hours to find potential partners, suppliers, and customers. Let's start. And we cannot start any better, any meeting on higher spectral imaging than to go to the most beautiful city in the world to go to the European Space Agency based in Nordbike, although I know Luca Marese is not currently here in Nordbike. Luca, thank you very much. Piacere, thank you so much for being with us today. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to the European Space Agency, goes to Luca Marese. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jose, for your warm welcome. I'm very proud to be here. And then I need to have somebody be in my presentation. Um, I think he's... Um, my colleague, Elis fritz yes. and also the person who holds this fantastic meeting together is the one sharing her screen on your behalf. Yes. Okay, so talking about hyperspectral instrument at ESA in six minutes, I think is a very interesting challenge because we do uh, a lot of hyperspectral. So if you can flip to the next page, please. Um, Okay, so we do earth observation with uh, our instrument. Please, next. So, and then we do uh, for a meteorological satellite. Next, please. For um, remote sensing for land and ocean. Next. Uh, for atmosphere. And next, for air quality. Next, please. And, and climate change. So, basically, all the possible domain of uh, remote sensing, we have developed a um, hyperspectral uh, um, instrument. Next, please. Uh, we also use um, hyperspectral in science. One of the most interesting missions we are busy uh, developing is uh, Ariel, for which the hyperspectral system will be used to detect um, earth like atmosphere. Um, it's a very challenging scientific mission for which uh, we will develop a hyperspectral instrument. Next, please. So what are the underlying technologies of a uh, hyperspectral? Next. So um, how a hyperspectral work in terms of uh, remote sensing, for those not familiar to space, we fly on a low Earth orbit. So in a flash plume configuration, we have a telescope, um, focusing the light on an entrance lid, a collimator, and dispersing element can be a prism, a grating, 
and then uh, some focusing lens, and then we get the spectrum on the array and how the satellite move. Please, next. We will uh, swap all the uh, wavelength, and then we can then have our spectrum. Next, please. So, and then uh, uh, we apply algorithm for um, understanding what's going on. One of the most challenging part for what we do is um, remote sensing of atmosphere where the spectrum is very, very um, uh, dense. So we need to apply very sophisticated inversion uh, algorithm to extract the information about gas concentration and so on. Next, please. So um, I can spend, you know, two hours uh, at least for each of these uh, instruments and they are big instrument like Sentinel-4 that is flying on MTG, Metos third generation. We have uh, Sentinel-5 on Metops second generation. Uh, the spectral range is invisible. We have a flex looking to um, uh, fluorescence of vegetation. And then we have the next generation Sentinel with Chime for Earth observation, land, CO2M for atmosphere, and uh, other instrument as well. Next. So we not only do, let me say, application pool, uh, where we have um, scientists or user defining requirements, but we also do a technology push for which we have developed one of the tiniest hyperspectral system. The one in the center is called HyperScout, and that is the full uh, payload that you see is 1.5 cubic unit. Next. So, um, this is just uh, the um, technology push we, uh, we do. And then this is just a list of activity. And in the next few graph, I will talk briefly to one of each. Next um, is um, uh, a set of instrument for uh, we um, call one is called Eloise, another is called uh, Chime and Chima. Um, they are all based on a grating spectrometer for which we have developed a, a dual blaze grating on a, a rapid solidified aluminum. And this is a modified Offner configuration for which we have acquired a patent and is keeping a number of instruments among which the Copernicus chime. Uh, next. This is um, uh, the other way around, instead of using a free form grating, we use a flat grating on free form mi uh, mirrors. So it's a compact spectrometer for atmospheric uh, monitoring. Next. Uh, then we have HyperScout, uh, the one I mentioned before. Instead of using a grating, we use a linear variable filter. So it allow us to build a very compact spectrometer and then we are able to deliver something like a spatial resolution of 70 meters from a 500 kilometer orbit. And it's a very neat instrument. You only use something like four watts and has been launched on a number of small sites. Next. Uh, same technology, but a little bit bigger, is an um, uh, uh, instrument called Ximba, Copa Hyperspectra for nanosatellite. We are building now the flight unit and then still use um, a linear variable filter as a resolving uh, system. Next. Uh, different type of technology. This is uh, basically a static Fourier transform spectrometer called spatial heterodyne spectrometer. It's based on a concept that was patented in 1954 and never built because the very tight tolerances to realize the um, heterodyne spectrometer. We built a breadboard a couple of years ago, and now we are busy developing um, a protofly unit. Next. And then science mission, uh, just to mention, as I said, Ariel, next. Uh, so Ariel is um, Atmospheric Remote Sensing Infrared Exoplanet Large Survey. is a satellite with a telescope with a primary mirror in aluminum of one meter by 700 millimeters. And then in the focal plane of this instrument, there is a hyperspectral instrument. Next. So, um, so the, is the objective of the mission is the uh, chemical sensor exoplanet. Next. 
and this you know big beast with 1300 uh, kilos next you can you can flip until the end uh, so this is give some information about the instrument the spectrometer is a low resolution near spectrometer and what is very you know challenging about this mission is that we need to cool all the instrument to cryogenic temperature okay and i think this is finishing my presentation and i don't know if you have any question or comments you may ask later on. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Luca, for a great presentation. Thank you very much for being with us today. The most important question at every one of our meetings is what challenges do you have? Mostly what all these companies in the room could do for you? What are your unmet needs in hyperspectral imaging? Oh, we, I mean, we call uh, hyperspectral imaging a sort of a Swiss army knife, okay? And so, um, so you can do a lot of uh, with hyperspectral imaging. Now we go to the two extreme. Uh, Chime is uh, 450 kilos hyperspectral imaging for which we want to have a very high performing instrument, something like uh, signal to noise ratio in the range of uh, 300, 350 with a ground safety distance of 20 meters. So there the challenge is to build this big beast and keep it together. So it is uh, mainly like, uh, uh, optomechanical design, cooling system. We have a detector in the uh, span chromatic detector that goes uh, from visible to uh, infrared, 2.6 microns. So we need to cool it down to 170 Kelvin. On the other side, we go for very tiny one, like the Hyperscout, where the challenge is to deliver acceptable performance at a very interesting price. And then to fly on board of a small satellite, like a 12 unit, a six unit CubeSat, the instrument has to cope with a very unstable avionics. So all the software and the way of acquiring data is defined by the satellite, not only, but uh, this satellite, they have, uh, for the ground leak, a VHS, VHF antenna. So there is so many data we can deliver per orbit. So we have a keypad, even this tiny uh, instrument with a powerful microcomputer to do level two data on board. So we deliver information like for example normalized differential vegetation index because there is no way we can deliver data because uh, it will collect something like a half a terabyte of data per orbit and so this uh, is too extreme okay in one case is what do we do with the data and so it's about using mm -hmm. software everybody's talking now artificial intelligence we we talk about um onboard data processing very powerful i mean you, you see how much you can do with the uh, uh, microprocessor you have in your telephone, you apply that to hyperspectral imaging. There's something we can do a lot on board. On the other extreme is about um, land. And also we, when we talk about atmospheric chemistry, for example, Sentinel-5, um, the, there the demanding requirement is, um, uh, as called, um, uh, stray light and, and the signal to noise ratio performance. Stray light, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's everything. It's coating, it's good design, it's uh, uh, control of uh, cleanliness. For example, tropomy, to keep uh, the instrument clean, we have to purge until the very last minute before launch. Okay, so there are multiple challenges. And I can tell you I've been in this business for 30 years and I never built twice the same instrument, never found twice the same challenges. So every time is a new discovery. Thank you very much, Luca, for being here. We have a lot of questions and challenges for you, but we wanted to do in this meeting, we wanted to do it a bit differently. So we selected a few companies in our network to come, and some of them you know very well, others you may not know so well. We're going to start uh, with three companies that mean a lot to us. We're going to start with Nireos, Hype, and High Specs. Nireos, okay. Fabrizio Preda. Fabrizio, thank you so much for being with us. We have agreed that you will show one slide and tell us how you could cooperate with the end users that we have in the room. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is actually Alex, not Fabrizio, but I'm from the same company. Can you hear yeah. me? Loud and clear. Fantastic. Let me share this slide right now. So we're based in Milan and uh, we're a company that builds interferometers primarily. One of our products is an imaging interferometer or a, a hyperspectral camera. And the main point of difference to most other hyperspectral images is that it works based on a Fourier transform process, uh, much like a Fourier transform spectrometer. 
So what we have is a, a, a compact common path interferometer that's very robust, placed in front of some imaging optics and a camera. And when you scan the interferometer, you effectively collect uh, an interferogram for every pixel. The camera is a, uh, can be almost any detector. So we typically use a, a fairly standard commercial uh, megapixel sensor, but depending on application that can be changed. You take a very high resolution uh, interferogram for each pixel, and then through doing a lot of Fourier transforms, you obtain a, a high quality spectrum for each of those pixels. So in the end, because it has no slits, we have very high throughput. The interferometer itself has a very broadband performance. So with different cameras, we have versions for the visible, near infrared, short wave infrared. And in fact, um, with the ESA, we have a project to develop a, a thermal infrared camera under development. I believe Fabrizio has spoken with Luca Marese about that. So yeah. happy to be here. And um, it's a very practical camera to use because it, it works in a, in a steering mode as opposed to a, a push broom mode. So for a lot of applications, that's very convenient. Of course, for like something like a low earth orbit, it may not be the right application, but for a lot of other applications, it's great. So we have high throughput, good spatial resolution, excellent uh, wavelength resolution. And um, yeah, and, and it's a super versatile instrument. So we're very proud of it. And it's fairly new. It's a fairly new concept. We're still finding new applications. So um, you can see here an example of us categorizing some uh, some something from a, a long field of view outside of our office window it also works in microscopy and i'd be really thrilled to hear if uh, anybody had a particular problem that might be solved by a product like this luca what is the, the what is the unique value that you see for for this camera it is a very interesting camera because it works from it can scan from visible to thermal infrared and being a common path interferometer it can be very compact, something like a shoebox. Um, so we have a contract with the Nireo and University of Milan to develop a prototype. So we can experiment a little bit and to un so we can see what are um, the advantages of this instrument with respect to classical uh, Fourier transfer spectrometer. They're the size of a six dishwashers. Okay, so it's a big change in dimension. So we are looking to different type of a uh, possible application, and uh, you have, should ask this question maybe in six months when the study will be finished. Okay. Yes, because Alex, the most important question is now: How can we help you? We have here the entire supply chain from companies who do packaging all the way to companies who do the detectors, the sensors, companies who are doing the electronics. What are the challenges that we can help you solve for you to fit uh, the dreams of your potential yeah, customers? Well, in the case of the of the project with with Luca, our main challenge is um, is finding the biofringent materials that we can use for the for this interferometer that work in the thermal infrared. Uh, we there are materials we use they work for a tra traditional interferometer, but as soon as you do imaging and have strict requirements on the the optical quality of the materials, it becomes difficult. So it's it's an interferometer that works through biofringence, through splitting the polarization of light. So if anybody's working on uh, new materials for biofringent optics that are functional out through the eight, 14 micron sort of window, we'd be thrilled to hear from them. Yeah, I'm all right. Alex, there is not many because the one we use there is uh, the one from a big company in Czech Republic, BBT. Who so are our partner on that project, I should add. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I know, I, but I, I have been working with BBT for many years, and and they're sort of unique in their field. But obviously, uh, maybe there are others I'm not aware of. Exactly. So, yeah. Thanks. We can, yes, uh, the next speaker is going to be uh, from DLR, from Germany. We are going to go to the German Aerospace Center to meet Uta Haydn. Uta, thank you very much for being with us. What we want to hear from you is this, so in these six minutes is how we can help you with your main challenges in the industry. The floor and the attention of everyone is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. I will share my screen. So thank you for this invitation and uh, for the interesting audience, actually. Um, I hope you can see my slides. Yes, I loud, we can see them crystal clear. Very good, thank you. So um, I also tried to rush through uh, our hyperspectral imaging systems that we developed for monitoring of the Earth system processes. Um, um, 
So this is just a very quick overview about uh, the systems uh, that are running on uh, at DLR. So we have two space-bound systems. One uh, is called NMAP. It's a really purely German mission and launched in 2022, uh, 1st of April. Um, and then there's another mission uh, called DASIS. It's a US cooperation with the, cooperation with the US company Teledyne and us. Uh, it's installed on the ISS, and I will come back later to these two missions. And we have also an airborne system. Um, we partnered with NEO. Uh, we have a high spec system, visible and near infrared, uh, on an operational basis. Um, and it's actually part of our um, sys service that we are running. It's the au pair service that collects. Uh, a lot of uh, parts such as uh, airborne um, um, data provision, uh, overflight, but also data processing. And as you can here see, we're also running um, UOE systems within the service. So uh, just quick words to DASIS. This is um, um, installed at the Muses platform that uh, is um, owned by Teledyne. Uh, DLR has developed the DSS instrument um, that was launched to the ISS in 2018. Um, we ha also have uh, developed the whole um, software for processing from the level zero to level two A. Um, and um, so, and this this is operational software which is licensed to uh, to, to Teledyne for their customers, um, and it's running on the Amazon cloud. Um, meanwhile, um, we have we are in the fifth year of operation, and here you can see a coverage of the scenes we have already acquired. And uh, you immediately will see, okay, there are a lot of holes in. If you have a look to the worldwide uh, data acquisitions, so what I would like to show you here is the mission priority uh, is really on multi-temper acquisitions, and for some of the areas, like here in the um, in the um, Western US, you can see there are a lot of uh, repetitions of uh, data and also in some selected areas here in Europe, but also in Africa. So I really would like to introduce you to explore uh, what is already in the archive. Uh, the archive is free and open, so you can uh, use the data that is already in the archive and uh, use it for your purposes. Then we have the NMAP mission uh, that started last November to be operational for the, uh, for the public. Uh, NMAP has an open uh, and free uh, um, data policy, so it's also usable for research, but also for companies. Um, here I collected a couple of uh, links. Uh, if you're interested in this data, please have a look. Uh, to planning.nmap.org. There you will find every information about how to access the data, how to task actually also the data, because that's something very important to know. Nmap as well as DASIS are uh, not, has not, have not the characteristics of Sentinel, which is regularly uh, acquiring data. It's um, that are sensors on demand. So it's on the demand of the users uh, to acquire data and to get data. This is the short um, comparison between the two instruments. On the middle row, you see DSIS uh, on the ISS installed. On the right side, you see NMAP. Uh, maybe some uh, specifics um, I would like to highlight here. Uh, the orbit is different. So ISS is on, uh, sorry, DSIS is on the ISS orbit, which um, is has um, some influences on the data acquisition, also regularity, we have no, repeat circle so um, and it's a non-sense and um, circle on the right image here you can see that in the green um, and that means um, we have this is limited and we cannot really get the very northern very southern part but this is different for nmap um, nmap has a sense and chronos orbit and it covers actually all the land masses uh, available in, in um, at the in the world we have uh, good tilting uh, capabilities, uh, but maybe another characteristic I would like to point you to is the spectral resolution. This is, has, I think, one of, actually it's a unique um, spectral resolution of 2.55 nanometers, 
which is, uh, I think you need worldwide, um, very high resolution. I can back and show you an, an, an application for which we can use that. And um, instead, NMAP has these, um, let's say standard spectral resolution, 6.5 nanometers for the visible and 10 nanometers for the sphere range. Then another facility I would like to introduce to is the hyperspectral, it's a calibration home base um, at DLR. It's also included in our OPERS service, which collects all the hyperspectral services at DLR. Uh, actually, the calibration home base is for uh, the optical characterization of hyperspectral sensors uh, in terms of spectral, uh, radiometric, and geometric characteristics, and it's all traceable to national standards. Um, we are doing regular characterization of, um, of some airborne instruments like high specs, like APEX uh, from Belgium and Swiss, and SPECMEX. And recently, uh, the CO2 image we're preparing the characterization also for the CO2 image mission. Just, I think, two slides for applications. Um, here you can see uh, we are quite active also in, in deriving water constituents. Um, in this uh, slide or this specific case here, we, we put our expertise in two things. The one is we rebuilt um, sensor system, uh, hyperspectral sensor system to validate the satellite um, uh, data sets and, and, and results. And the other is uh, DLR supports also uh, our project partner. In this case, it is AVI. Um, the, um, we are supporting them with a radiative transfer model with which we can retrieve water constituents. Um, and then another um, um, very interesting project where we use the highest spectral resolution of thesis um, of the 2.55 nanometers, we are trying to, um, to um, retrieve fluorescence by combining um, the very high spectral resolution of thesis with machine learning um, and in cooperation with the Forschung Centrum Jülich. So this is also a very um, interesting project where we try to test the limits um, and how far we can get with this hyperspectral instrument. Now that's from my side. I hope I didn't uh, I had to use too much time. Thank you very much for your attention. Uta, thank you so much for a great presentation. It is great to have you here. I'm a huge fan of the Tips Insight project. You're doing a fantastic job there. Could you, the same thing as look at it, could you share with us a couple of challenges that the companies here in the room, and you see you have a fantastic audience in front of you, the companies here in the room can help you with? Well, I mean, I'm speaking more of the application side. So um, what, what for us is always very interesting is for which purposes do you use those instruments and what are your challenges? I mean, in DLR, we are developing these, um, um, all the processing um, chains from the level zero to level one, A, one B, two A and so on. And for us, it's always interesting to, to see what are the challenges for the users not just from the instrument side, but also from the use of the data sets. Um, what, what are your requests? Um, how often would you like to use um, the data? Uh, what are the applications you mainly use it for? So this is something very important for us that also helps us to, to improve our processing chains, to get validation on calibration, better calibration data for, for our instruments. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's something that uh, that is uh, um, a lot of complication, uh, especially for the amount of data that you have, and uh, and also for the calibration. So I know uh, Tron from Hypex uh, is here. So Tron, uh, can you can you tell us a little bit uh, how to do the calibration for Hypex? Tron, are you there? Hi, I'm here. Can you please repeat the question if I can tell you about what? Uh, yeah, about, about how to do the calibration for the high 
Although DLR is a very good customer of ours. They had our systems now for 13 years and their lab that uh, Uta was talking about is really, really good. We have a similar lab in Norway, of course. So we do uh, traceable calibration to NIST and PTB standards as well. And the calibration is, and characterization is not a straightforward thing. It's a, it involves quite a lot of steps. So. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, can you, can you please share? I know we have, uh, uh, you have a slide. Can you please share it? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, would, that, would, you, would you please stop sharing the slides? Yeah. Yeah, if you can. Thank you so much. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Tron, um, here we go. Yeah. You see it? Yes. Yeah. So, one slide uh, to try to cover what we are doing. Um, yeah. We, uh, we make a hyperspectral system, high quality hyperspectral systems in many different applications. We are based in Norway, in Oslo. Um, we have been supplying airborne. Uh, we started with airborne uh, and UEV system, lab system, industrial system for the last 20 years. Um, we, our main focus is spectral fidelity per pixel. So we, we have a quality like Luca was talking about, oh, a focus like Luca was talking about in the beginning about the optical design, the quality of the optics, the correction, uh, the spatial spectral misregistration correction in the optics. So we aim for always the highest spectral fidelity in the data, of course. Uh, we, all of our cameras so far is push broom. So uh, there are no like temporal issues. We, we gather all the data at the same, or all the spectral information from one pixel at the same time. Uh, yeah, we, um, we have three kind of main brands of, of cameras. It's the classical cameras that you see in the top here, which is for lab airborne and industrial, uh, lab airborne and yeah, uh, core scanning, XY scanning and so on. Uh, we have the industrial brand called Balder which is for in industry like this, or in the mineral sorters and so on. And then we have Mjolnir, which is uh, our uh, drone systems. Um, uh, yeah, so also relevant actually for this, this uh, meeting here is our ESA in orbit demonstrated project where we are making a hyperspectral system in the uh, shortwave range from uh, uh, 960 to 2500. Uh, that's an in-orbit demonstrated project for ESA called HyperNOR. Uh, we hope to launch this in 26, 27. Uh, we also did a, a new system last year with USGS and NASA, a stratospheric uh, system, which flew on the ER2 platform from NASA. So we are trying to do a lot of different stuff in, uh, with a relatively small, small company uh, based in Norway. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tron. We also we also have uh, in the in the room uh, we have Tobias Kreplo from Hype Solution. Tobias, are you there? Please, can you share the slide? Yes, for sure. Just give me a quick second. Yeah. So, would you present yourself to? Yeah. Absolutely. You see the screen? Yes, we can see it's clear. Perfect. All right. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for the invitation and having me. So my name is uh, Tobias Kreklo. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO of a company called Hype Solutions. We are based in Hanover, Germany. Uh, we are quite a, a young company, I would say, in the spectral industry, and are mostly focusing on delivering very user-friendly solutions. And one solution I wanted to present today here is um, the uh, product, what we call Blackbird, uh, or even the version two, which is a hyperspectral camera um, dedicated to DJI Enterprise drones. And, and why that is that mainly uh, people working in the, um, I would say, environmental sector uh, doing research in the field on agricultural uh, purposes or environmental monitoring are very used to these type of drones. They are well established. Um, there's, as you can see on the bottom right image, there's uh, a ton of different payloads. Um, and so people who are familiar with these type of drones, they really uh, love this type of device because it's super easy plug and play. So I actually have one of one of the cameras here in my hand. So this is the, the size of device that you're uh, used to. And what is really nice, you have just like one connection, which is the uh, DJI SkyPod connector, where you can establish everything from the data and power delivery um, from the sensor towards the drone. And so you already also get a RGB live stream, for example, down to the remote controller, uh, which is then very easy for the user uh, to work on such a device, especially if they are used to using other type of DJI payloads. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. So that's going to be very helpful, uh, especially for 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 Earth observation too. So um, when when we are talking about the uh, low low uh, distance, uh, for and that's actually very good because our next speaker is uh, Robert Green. Uh, Robert Green is uh, from JPL, from Jet Propulsion Lab, NASA, and it's a principal investigation on air surface and mineral dust. Uh, so, uh, Robert, all the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can hear you, we can see you. All right, good, yes. hopefully my, there, all right, there we go. Excellent. Okay, uh, imaging spectroscopy is what I've done for more than 30 years um, for Earth science applications and throughout the solar system. You had a brief description of the concept. I think most people understand, but it's a concept push broom imaging spectrometer with a swath through a telescope to spectrometer, putting the spectra on the columns of the detector array, collecting image cubes, processing those for information to make decisions, whether that's science, applications, or discovery throughout the solar system. And I really liked uh, the point that we want high fidelity instruments. We want the same spectral calibration for every cross track element. And we want all the wavelengths to come from the same location. And that's really critical for useful information where we deliver units and quantifiable uncertainties. Um, again, why would you do spectroscopy versus multispectral? I think everyone here understands there's much more content. If you collect the whole spectrum, you can identify different absorptions here I'm showing for uh, mineral hematite, electron transition, overtones from an OH stretch and uh, kaolinite and carbonate. So in one spectrum, you can say there are three materials present and you can say how much each is present. If you look at that with a Landsat, you can't do any of that. So really the spectroscopy is the way to go. Um, I tend not to use the word hyperspectral because it means excessively spectral. So I just, it's just spectroscopy. Fraunhofer invented it in uh, 1814 here in Europe. Um, the Earth is rich with spectral signatures, um, whether it's minerals, um, and I've included uh, um, lithium bearing minerals and rare earth minerals in that plot up here. Uh, the vegetation uh, has lots of different spectral signatures depending on the concentration of the different constituents and how they're portrayed in a canopy, lots of agricultural applications. The atmosphere is rich with signatures. Uh, if you're interested in the atmosphere, if you're interested in the surface, you have to get through the atmosphere. Coastal and then waters, we heard about that. Coral reefs, algal, cyanobacteria, harmful algal blooms. Uh, oil spills on the surface have spectral signatures. We've used it to look at uh, the big oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And snow has interesting spectral signatures. Snow is very colorful if you look at wavelengths other than our eyes. So their system is just rich with spectral signatures. I've been fortunate to be the PI for the instrument called Avaris since 1987. And if you go to Google Scholar and you put in that acronym, you'll find more than 35,000 results indicating that um, uh, there's lots of interest in this type of measurement, as I think everyone on this call understands. Spectroscopy makes sense, as we pointed out with exoplanets. It also makes sense for the other planets through our solar system. And I've been involved. We're building the uh, my spectrometer for Europa right now. We're building another spectrometer to go to the moon called HVM cube. We built the M cube that went to the moon. We built, we played a role in building Chrism, which flew to Mars. So lots of interesting spectral signatures throughout the solar system that warrant measuring images where every point in that image is a spectrum. Uh, just for history, this is the first imaging spectrometer ever built. I know, I, this was proposed in 1979. It first flew in 1982, before many people were in this field were born, uh, I suspect. It used a 32 by 32 element. Um, uh, mercury cadmium telluride array, so not a megapixel, but a K pixel. Um, there's a picture of the instrument. Uh, there's the, the, it only had 32 cross track elements and 32 wavelengths, but it was a digital imaging spectrometer and it made discoveries on some of its first flights. So that's what actually, this is the instrument that drew me to JPL NASA. Um, and uh, that's where I spent my entire career effectively. Then I wanted to talk about the more recent spectrometer. This is the Earth. Earth's surface mineral dust source in investigation. It's an imaging spectrometer proposed to do a specific science problem, but it has general utility. Uh, it was launched on the uh, 14th of July, 2022. So that's a long way from AAS, but it's also a push broom imaging spectrometer. Um, this is our approach to that solution. It's the optically fast Dyson spectrometer, F1.8, uh, two mirror telescope, Dyson block, 
uh, to a large concave grating that has a shaped blaze through the block to an ordering filter and a detector ray. We need help with industry in every area here, including subsystems. So there's lots of room, whether it's thermal detector, order sorting filters, mirrors, or full subsystems, electronics, there's lots of room. There's a picture of the CAD, there's the instrument spectrometer alignment, uh, nearly finished, ready to ship to the Cape. Uh, we launched it, um, this was first light over Australia. It's a full range spectrometer, so 380 to 2500 nanometers, 285 spectral bands. There's the spectral signatures of the Earth. It uses a single uh, substrate removed Mercad detector, so it's only one detector system over that whole range. We're fulfilling our objectives. Here's mapping minerals near Cape Town. So there's an image cube. There's the radiance calibrated to what we measure. There's the reflectance. There's maps of the minerals, and that leads towards applications. High fidelity is the key here. We've taken everything that was said earlier. There's very, the, very, the, the misregistration is very low. The spectral calibration across 1,240 spectrometers is within 2%. Uh, all the wavelengths come from the same location and it's very high signal noise. These are all key and driving needs for the measurements. Um, we've collected 20,000 image cubes on six continents. These are all available to you or anyone uh, from the land processes DAC um, in uh, uh, Sioux Falls. And there's a QR code if you wanna go to that. One of the other things covering the spectral range with this type of resolution is we can see greenhouse gases. So here are plumes of methane and carbon dioxide measured by emit. Um, there's the fingerprint measured by emit in blue and modeled in red. So this is methane, this is carbon dioxide. These are big plumes in Asia. These are big methane plumes, huge methane plumes near the Caspian Sea. Um, so for NASA, we've begun to map plumes. We have hundreds of plumes and plume complexes mapped. You can see these at the same website under the greenhouse gas button. So hopefully this is also something we can contribute to in make people aware of where greenhouse gas plumes are and then they can think about what they might do if to mitigate them, if that's their choice. So um, another capability of imaging spectroscopy. And that's what I had for my six minutes. Thank you very much. Thank There's you very much, Robert. Thank you for a great presentation. You said a couple of times here in Europe. Robert, where am I catching you right now? I'm at the uh, European uh, Geophysical Union, EGU. Oh, okay. So I was going to ask you, you know, a beautiful city north of the United States called Busman, Montana. Yes, I know that well. Yes. Yeah, me too. And here with us, we have Casey, Casey, CTO of Resono. They are in beautiful Busman. Casey, thank you very much for joining. You just saw the presentation by Robert. I would like for you to tell us what you do, and let's see what kind of things we can do together here. Great. Thanks so much for having us. Um, let me share, share my screen here. Um, For those of you who didn't have the chance to go to Busman, you should go. I was there last year. It's fascinating. <laughs> well, it snowed. It snowed again last night. It, it's never ending. So maybe you want to wait a few months before you come. Unless uh, you like to. I'm, I want to start this slide um, over here on the the upper right side with the project. Can you can you go in slideshow mode? We want to see it as big oh, as sorry. it itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, to the down, yeah. Is that working? Uh, it's okay. Go ahead. It's fine. Okay. Um, so we started 20 years ago, and our our um, directive from the beginning was to avoid space because uh, what we wanted to do was is develop terrestrial applications, make hyperspectral smaller, more affordable. And ironically, now we are um, scheduled to launch a uh, satellite. Um, hyperspectral imager uh, of sorts. I guess it's it's technically not maybe imaging, but um, in a way it is. Uh, we won't get into that. Um, called Arcstone, and the mission of Arcstone is to calibrate the reflectivity of the moon to much uh, greater precision than it is now. So right now it's between five to ten percent um, uncertainty, and this instrument should bring that down in order of magnitude from one half to 1%. And if, if you're familiar with uh, calibration and radiometry, you know that that's a very difficult problem. So we had to develop a, a very interesting uh, instrument design in order to achieve that goal. 
Um, and it, it's a complicated uh, instrument, but we're very excited to have this uh, contributing to the community. Many of the satellites um, that we've talked about today might be able to benefit from uh, having a higher standard of lunar calibration. And then for our commercial instruments, I mean, I think the thing that's interesting about Resonon is that the same optical engineers and, and mechanical engineers that design ArcStone um, work on our, our laboratory and UAV instruments as well. So that same uh, sort of quality and data fidelity can be available um, at a pretty pretty low cost and, and small size and weight. You can see a few of our instruments here um, mounted on an M300 and uh another the altal altal x drone and then uh, a system that's set up on a tripod for outdoor use uh, casey i'm gonna ask robert uh, something that i think is important for all of us to know robert if you could highlight two three challenges on the hyperspectral imaging supply chain of today what would be those what would be the over 30 years of working in the hyperspectral imaging sector what would be still the three headaches that you still have i mean it's it's the fidelity. We talked about that earlier. You need know, all the spectrometers that you're flying together to have the same calibration and all the wavelengths coming from the same location on the ground. And high, so that coupled with high signal to noise makes them very challenging. So any components or designs or ideas that um, uh, advance high fidelity imaging spectrometers, because with those you can get information that has units and uncertainties and you can make decisions. That's what leads to uh, commercial uses and scientific uses. And we are going to have now a little bit of a discussion before we go to the last speaker from ISSI. We have every single company in the relevant photonic industry for hyperspectral imaging being represented today. So let's have a nice Nice discussion uh, to start with. Uh, one of the presentations before, they has told us about their need for birefringence materials. Uh, I want to go back to Alex Barker from Ideos. Alex, in your presentation, you told us about that particular need. Uh, we would like to see how other companies in our network, in the Optica industry network can help. So one of the companies that we invited today to be in the room is the company Kerdry. Kerdry joined Optica last month. Uh, thank you very much, Jorge, for being with us as corporate member of Optica. Uh, what do you think about the challenge that Alex put on the table? And also tell us a bit, what is Kerdry and how could you help? Okay. Uh, my name is Jorge Sanchez. Thank you for, for the time, for the opportunity to join this interesting and wonderful community. And uh, we could show perhaps directly, Jose, our added value in hyperspectral sensing. That's right. Yep. I'm sure that Jorge has prepared a slide for us to tell us how we're going to help us. Yes, thank you so much for that. All the corporate members have prepared for this now. This is fantastic. Jorge, tell us. Okay, uh, I belong since October 22. Um, Kedri belong in two, two HF business unit photonics recently created some years ago. HAF is located in the east, southeast of France, while Kedri uh, is in Brittany, in the, in the coast in the channel, in fact, face to the United Kingdom. Okay. Um, since 23, Kedri, its added value in the business unit of photonics is thin film technologies and coatings from taking into account specific R&D requirements until mass production at wide range of markets are already targeted as a space defense metrology photonics in general. Okay. As you may guess, our specific added value is PVD-based technologies. More than 15 PVD machines, all different technologies uh, mixed in more than 1,000 mit square meters clean room facility from ISO 5 to 7. Already available for industrial and prototyping applications, more than 35 chambers in the in the whole HEF group 
optical business unit, I repeat again. The optical treatments covering from UV to IR in all different, in different applications with capacity up to right now 55 inches uh, capability for, for treatments. Next, next uh, month and beginning of, of, of summer, I would say better, we would qualify a special machine up to 70, 75 inches uh, diameter. We also propose, obviously, a photolithography services up to inches, inches right now with a resolutions a approximately in the micron. Okay. Our, our electro, our filtering proposal in this range of hyper spectral is that we are working already available to customize, depending on applications, a highly selective uh, hyperspectral sensing with an OD up to five, covering the ranges. So there, 1400 in the visible range near infrared until 1.243 microns um, spectral range. The extractor components, obviously, we propose both uh, both op options for multi zone arrays, that is either a, a fully integrated uh, photolithography pattern or hybrid monolithically integrated uh, building blocks, okay, with improved band and transmittance and higher attenuation over the rejection range. Obviously, with, our, with one of our best uh, proposals in the market, which is in the integration with black coatings. Uh, capabilities for better uh, for optimized integrations. We in process and already tested uh, devices in the space range usage and ready for practical operations with customized um, designs for a specific requirements for our potential customers based on our previous um, describe industrial capabilities. And if further or other interest on, on this area, delighted to discuss with you in the in the coordinates and in the my mails and phones that I uh, provided here. And thank you again for, for, for this first time on behalf of Perdri. Thank you very much, Jorge, on behalf of Optica. Remember, the next time is one slide only, but it was fantastic to hear from you for the first time. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we are looking for birefringent materials from the 8 to 14 micrometer wavelength range. We can see in your slide that you were addressing all the way to 6 micron. Is there any R&D line that cover longer, long wave infrared? Uh, was that a question directed to me, yes, Jose? Alex. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Are there any any research lines? Well, as as far as I know, uh, the 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 selection of materials for biofringent optics in in the thermal infrared range is very limited. The I, I think maybe even limited to one material only, which is called Calamel and is produced by a Czech company who is, as Luca was mentioning, is our partner in the project. Uh, I I don't know if there exist any other materials or research programs beyond that, and in fact that's certainly why I was putting the question out there because I'd be interested to know. Um, I, I, perhaps Luca has something to add to that, that that I don't know because that's about where my knowledge on that, on that, that research front stops. Luca? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, as I said before, we, we work on this material, I think in the last 10 years and there's a very specific uh, crystal, very difficult to grow. And it took, um, uh, BBT something like 20 years to to arrive to a point in which they can grow crystal of a reasonable size. So now we are the size of something like a sugar, we call a sugar cube, just to give you an idea, one centimeter by one centimeter. And it's a very lengthy process. It's a very niche market. Um, and so I'm not sure if there is any other company willing to endeavor in this type of things. We are also working with BBT to develop even a better material. Uh, cadmium bromide, there will be an even longer uh, wave range. So from now we go something like from 500 nanometers to uh, 10 microns. 
So it's amazing. And also what is interesting is the it's a real B refringent material. So the group velocity of the of uh, the speed of light is 40 times faster in one axis than the other axis. So it allows us to make uh, uh, polarimeters and a number of applications that are very, very interesting. Thank you very uh, much, Luca, for this. Remember, we are not event organizers here. We are com we are people who want to know the companies very well. So, Helena, here is yeah. the challenge. We are looking for a nonlinear crystal by refringent between 8 to 14 micrometers. So, please contact yeah, yeah, our yeah. members on that. We need to find a solution for this. Or the other way around, if you find application for the materials, I think BBT would be happy to, to deliver more of those materials because, I mean, Ireo has a common path interferometer. It's a very specific design, but it can be used also for a polarizer. So if you need a polarizer with an extinguishing ratio of a thousand <clears throat> that works from the visible to the infrared, that's the material. Exactly, I want to, yeah. to go back now to, to the, the hammer of thunder god Mjolnir. I want to understand, uh, Trond, you, before you presented how you put the drone into the UAV and later on in the satellite, I want to stay a bit on the UAV and Resonon also showed it as well. Uh, what are the key challenges for bringing a hyperspectral imaging camera to a UAV? Yeah, it's already, as Robert also said, it's already challenges to do to make uh, a high spectral fidelity instruments uh, when size is not a kind of a limitation. Uh, when you bring everything down to a drone system, uh, yeah, you need to make it compact, smaller, and still you need light sensitivity to get a decent signal to noise ratio, and you need optics to correct for all the aberrations. So all this together is uh, very challenging in a drone applications. And uh, again, you also need high quality navigation system. You need all these things. Everything needs to be a good quality and sizes and weight is a limitation and also power. So in, it's a, uh, yeah. In all my travels, Trond, I, I went to New York last two weeks ago and I visited a company called PLX. And they told me about a technology called MOST that actually provides very high, high efficient and also high reliable optical systems. When I told them that you were going to be here, they told me, I want to show what we can do. So PLX, Malcolm Humphrey, Chief Technology Officer of PLX, tell us how we can help the companies who are bringing her spectral imaging cameras to different harsh environments. Good morning. Thank you, Jose. So uh, we are PLX. We're a New York-based company. Uh, we have a long history in space and aerospace and defense applications. Uh, and we invented the monolithic optical structure technology back in the 1990s. So essentially, this is a way of constructing an optical subsystem such that the uh, structure and optics are all one material that is thermally matched. Um, and the reason we do this is it gives you extreme stability under the harshest environmental conditions. So to give you an example, we hold uh, sub arc second beams pointing accuracy over 100 degree thermal variations. So for applications in drones in space, um, this is extremely valuable where you have you know, extreme temperature changes, you have extremes of shock and vibration during launch and flight. Um, these systems really help you uh, achieve that high level of accuracy. So it's a monolithic sandwich construction. We can incorporate beam splitters, mirrors, lenses. Uh, we can incorporate polarizers, films, uh, active, optics, uh, active optical devices like detectors and beam steering devices, fiber launch stages. Those can all be incorporated within this monolithic optical subsystem. So that it means uh, effectively, we have a plug and play optic. It's pre aligned. You fit it to your system uh, and you can guarantee that um, alignment and reliability will never change. The other technology we're looking at is using this for active beam steering systems. So, one of the technologies might be of interest to high specs there is we're actually looking at a drone tracking system. Um, using uh, pulsed lasers that would track drones to a very high degree of accuracy. So again, arc second um, position, uh, bearing um, sub 30 centimeter ranging. So you could have a ground station which tracks the exact position of your drone very accurately. So there's a, there's a lot of different areas I think where you know we we can help. The picture you see on the screen right there 
on the top side. That's our monolithic interferometer. Uh, we also make monolithic spectrometers um, and various other monolithic point, um, optical devices like bore sighting systems, lateral transfer reflectors and retroreflectors. Thank you very much for that. I know you have been uh, contacting very often our corporate members, so we're looking for companies to partner with. What are the key challenges that you would have right now and you would like the rest of the room to help you with? Um, that's a good question. I mean, we're, we're very interested in beam steering devices, um, you know, that's particularly in the, uh, for the counter drone market. We're very interested in other applications of our technology, particularly where you need to incorporate the, uh, the active optical devices with the passive optics there. Mm -hmm. um, we are actively looking for coating partners. Um, you know, that's always a challenge for the very high end uh, optical requirements that we get, uh, new materials for coating, new ma low expansion materials, um, all those aspects that we're looking at. For the coatings, you are at the right room. I want to bring you in touch with one dear friend of mine who has been in my career for the last years, Jason Palivar from Iridian. Thank you very much for being with us. Tell us how, how you could help a company like PLX and also you could help companies who bring different optics or different optical systems to multispectral and hyperspectral imaging, Jason. Yeah, thanks very much, Jose. Uh, happy to participate and share great meetings so far. Lots of interesting topics. So. Iridian, uh, we're, we're all about um, custom wavelength selective optical filters. And so in, in the this, this sphere of hyperspectral, uh, not ter terrifically involved, although we do get involved with some order sorting filters, really hard to see when you're on a screen like this, but you can see some pattern filters um, in, in, in our capabilities through photolithographic um, multi-zone order sorting filters or order sorting filters array. And uh, more commonly in, in this, this uh, space um, multispectral imaging uh, so where, where you're needing to have a, a multispectral optical filter for um, earth observation or other other you know, whatever uh, process applications where you need multiple multiple wavelengths in your detector we do um, optical filter uh, arrays as assemblies uh, and as uh, photolithographic patterned arrays again you see on the screen there and there's a nice pretty one on the on the camera here live and in person including uh, black coatings as well we have many of these this is not a new technology for us. We have hundreds flying in low earth orbit now uh, and many hundreds in, in, in process uh, applications. Again, where you need specific wavelengths in, in one band and, and not everything else in front of the other pixels. In terms of uh, beam steering, um, there, we do dichroic filters. So uh, you're looking at to you know, reflect specific wavelengths of light, transmit other wavelengths of light. It's not all multi-band. We also do you know, single band filters, edge fast filters as well. We don't do a lot of coatings on, on customer supplied optics. We do occasionally, we, we sort of have our workhorse materials that we work with and, and the, the substrates. So something uh, creative uh, in a new substrate might be a bit of a challenge, but we'd certainly be um, happy to, to, to discuss it with anybody who's interested. Again, it's all about customization to meet a particular customer's needs as opposed to a, a, a a specific product space. Yes, and this is a very important topic because we have few sure. companies who are looking at the mid infrared segment, uh, like like uh, Nireos, yep. Alex presented before. Uh, you have been uh, quite a reference company in the field of mid infrared optics. Uh, sure. Could you comment on how long in wavelength uh, you can go? Is it 15 micrometers the, the highest maximum? Or what sure. are the wavelength ranges that you feel that are more relevant for this segment? It's hard to say what the max is right now, Jose. We Previously, up until a couple of years ago, I would have said 10. Uh, almost everything we do is, is um, energetic magnetron sputtering, but we recently brought into uh, to our house uh, one of our chambers that also has evaporative capabilities. So we've expanded that wave range. The, the sputtered materials start to get dark above about 10 microns, so we start to lose transmission gradually. Um, but we, by, with evaporation, we can use different materials. We can extend this to 15 microns and perhaps more depending on the exact spectral needs, you know, how, how narrow the filter needs to be, uh, how high the transmission and deep and broad the blocking. Fundamentally, we, we don't make anything transmit more than it naturally does. All we do is add blocking. And so if you need deeper and broader blocking, the filters become more and more complex, but uh, we're happy to work up to about 15 microns uh, in the mid and long wave infrared. These, these arrays that I talk about, we have a, a, a number of you know, veneer, uh, visible near infrared, uh, arrays, SWEAR arrays. We've also got the, the, the picture next to our now defunct Canadian penny there 
is a uh, mid and long wave infrared array that, um, that we built almost a decade ago with uh, bands from three to about 14 microns doing, uh, uh, which was for the Canadian Space Agency's uh, Space Technology Development Program, the Polar Communication and Weather uh, Satellite looking at different uh, uh, atmospheric bands. So certainly happy to work up into the mid and long wave infrared uh, as needed. We have addressed already the coatings, we have addressed the optics, we still have to address the light source, and we still have to address the data challenge. When we go to these two topics, it's going to be fascinating. But before that, I want to give the floor to our fourth, our fourth speaker today. I want to go to the ISSI Center. I want to meet Michael Rust. Michael, thank you very much for being with us today. Tell us how this community, you see they are here because they want to work together, use it. Tell us how we can help you, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, Jose, hi everybody. Uh, thanks very much for having me uh, today. I'm coming from a slightly different angle than my previous speaking colleagues. Um, and I'm not focusing on imaging uh, spectroscopy technology, even though I've also a bit like, like Rob been for several decades in this field. I'm coming more from, from the mission requirements angle. And this is where I've been, what I've been working on at ESA, the European Space Agency. Up until last year, I was uh, the mission scientist for, for CHIME, one of the Copernicus hyperspectral missions. I'll talk about the mission a little bit here because I still uh, uh, consult a little bit uh, for, for ESA, but my, my new job now after retiring from ESA is I'm working for the International Space Science Institute for ESI in the beautiful city of, of Bern. So, Jose, you add those to your most beautiful cities that you know. I hope you've been to Bern. Um, this is a scientifically independent and, and neutral space and earth science institute that advances science by facilitating open multidisciplinary discourses in a stimulating environment. And it's, of course, reaching out to new, uh, towards new scientific horizons. It's, it's internationally known for addressing fundamental science questions, but I have to emphasize you all know Switzerland as a, as a neutral um, country, and, and ESI is a little bit of a, of, of a neutral science platform as it enables unencumbered by any political or financial or, or other constraints, scientists to, to, to meet and to, to have an open debate. And, and, and the organizers have asked me to try and bring my former life working on the mission requirements of a spaceborne imaging spectrometer together with my new affiliation, this Space Science Institute, which now also has a large part in Earth science. So you saw the jigsaw panels now at the left, uh, the, this jigsaw pieces, but also before these are all space science motives. Um, but ISI, which was founded uh, by the, the late Johannes Geis, you see a picture uh, top right here, um, in, in 1994, but basically it was formed as a foundation under, under the Swiss law in, in 1995. And it's been coming along uh, very, very nice. And now since 2013, has a sister institute in, um, in, in Beijing. Uh, so this is ISI Beijing. And, and Johannes Geis got, got very famous by having um, the first uh, solar particle uh, flags or, or, or established on the moon. His experiments were on all the Apollo mission. And rumor has it that the solar particle experiment was actually erected on, on the moon by Buzz Aldrin before the American flag was raised. So um, Johannes Geis founded ISI uh, that time ago. And you see on, on the right hand side, uh, you see here. Uh, sorry, this, my mouse was just uh, going down. You see the different uh, disciplines that ISI addresses, which is uh, solar magnetosphere and plasma, solar physics, astrophysics, earth science has become now a firm part of ISI and um, uh, planets, exoplanets and small bodies. These are encompassing the five scientific disciplines ISI keeps itself busy with. And what you see here is, is, is a graph which is trying to tell a big story for which unfortunately we don't have the time today, but I would really encourage you to, if you don't know ISI, to read up on, on it at www.isibaron.ch. But very briefly, ISI works with seven funding instruments. We also call them our scientific tools. And the, very importantly are the ones on the right, the working groups, the international teams, the workshops and the fora, um, which are actually 
all tools uh, to which scientists are joining on invitation only. So these are not open workshops. These are hand-picked meetings that in a different fashion, for for instance, are free-ranging debates of 15 to 25 peoples. Workshop are four-week workshops, which um, um, hold up until 50 people. And what is common to those four is that usually the accommodation is covered by us uh, and the per diem. So you basically come to ISI on invitation and all you need to cater for is basically your travel to ISI and then we look after you. But besides those different tools addressing uh, scientific questions, we also have individuals visiting us, so visiting scientists, early career researchers and postdocs. Then we have the Johannes Geis Fellowship. And, and, and those are individuals that come to ISI to do scientific work there. At the end of all of those tools, there are publications. So all we do, every produce of either the individuals or the groups and teams are publications. And we, we closely work together with, uh, with the Springer Press. But before that, I'll just give you a few numbers. We have had uh, 6,000, over 6,500 individual scientists that have visited us over the last 26 years since the foundation um, of ISI. Um, we had of those uh, tools you've just seen over 568 international teams. And we do publish with a relatively good impact factor through the Springer Press uh, media about 300 journal papers, all of them peer reviewed per year. Uh, we've been accommodating, booking over 70,000 um, hotel nights and uh, a bit with a, with a tongue in cheek, but it's really important because some of the great uh, scientific ideas um, are born uh, around our big coffee machine in, in, the, in, the, in the lounge of, of, of ISI. And rumor has it that we've produced now close to a quarter million cup of coffee over the last 25 years. And... Um, those publications, they, uh, you see them here. These are the Springer books that are published um, um, and they consist out of the, usually in, uh, in the earth science case, in surveys, in geophysics, the individual papers that all peer reviews are published and then they are collected in these paper selections. Now I'm trying to bridge now to our uh, today's uh, uh, main uh, subject, which is imaging spectroscopy. And you see, um, and I don't know if you can see my mouse uh, uh, circling over exploring the Earth's ecosystems on a global scale, which was addressing the requirements, capabilities, and directions in spaceborne imaging spectroscopy back in 2016. And, and of course, also um, my colleagues who were speaking before, Uta Hein, Robert Green, they were back at that uh, time participating in this one week workshop where we were trying to really harmonize upon imaging spectroscopy mission requirements establishment. And those of you, you who, who heard Luca, Luca, my colleague Luca Maresi at the beginning, he talked about a Swiss army knife and this was confirmed by Rob Green's slide um, of the different uh, um, um, earth discipline areas, uh, which produce so many different spectra. And what you see is the Copernicus hyperspectral imaging mission for the environment, in short, uh, Chime logo that in 2017, when the current fleet of Sentinel satellites by the European Commission were expanded by the so-called expansion candidates, six of them, one of them is that imaging spectrometer Chime, which is other than the scientific instruments that um, are usually supported by ESI and were previously also developed by the European Space Agency. This time, like all Sentinels, like all Copernicus space -borne components um, are supposed to be operational. CHIME is supposed to provide routine hyperspectral measurements in support of the European Union's policies for natural resources and asset management with a focus on food security, agriculture, raw materials and soil properties. All of them are intertwined, of course. And here I open the other folders of a Swiss army knife, biodiversity, ecosystem sustainability, uh, aquatic ecosystem, snow grain sizes, 
um, and albedos, environmental degradation, are those secondary applications that are not the main blade of that Swiss army knife, but which can be opened and satisfactorily satisfied with a different spectra as well. You see a spectrum in the bottom middle, which uh, a dry, which addresses the green and dry vegetation. And in order to see the difference in the power of spectroscopy, Rob's alluded to it, and Uta has as well, um, the different spectral coverage of multispectral sensors, which are not allowing us to unambiguously identify and quantify um, the different components of, for instance, minerals and soils, once you're only in inverted commas working with multispectral systems, on the right hand side, you see those uh, systems that are um, already in space, besides, of course, Chime, which has yet to come. And uh, the mission requirements that were unearthed with those uh, uh, workshop uh, participants at ECN are published in that book um, are, in short, summarized here. So we have routine operational hyperspectral observations of global land and coastal areas with two satellites. We tried to get to a revisit of 12 and a half days over the visible to short wave infrared uh, spectral range with a, a contiguous sampling interval of less than 10 nanometers and a spatial resolution of 30 meter. I echo what's been said before, a high radiometric, we, had, we heard the word fidelity, we heard accuracy, and of course, a very high signal to noise ratio. Out of the close to 30, variables that have identified as targets for CHIME. There are 12 so-called high priority prototype products of which currently five are being uh, prototyped and you see them here. Um, I'm not gonna read them out to you, you can read them for yourselves, but you see again that the balance of, oh now this uh, changed myself, that the balance of, of foci for the mission is really between the agriculture and food security sector and the soils and, and, and the raw material detections, um, which is of course chemometrics and, and of course minerals, as well as uh, different methods to identify and address uh, canopy and leaf pigments and to quantify those components, besides of course uh, uh, pro uh, uh, products such as leaf mass per area and the leaf area index. As far as the space segment goes, I can say this is, uh, and I've been with the agency for a long, long time. I think the only project I've seen that uh, has always kept its schedule and in some of its milestones, it's actually been ahead of schedule. Um, the pre preliminary design review was successfully completed last year. Uh, the start of phase CD um, also initiated at the end of last year. We are now looking at the critical design review board meeting to happen at the second, or let's say the, the second quarter of 2025, and the quality acceptance review of the PFM is uh, scheduled for 2028. And I think um, under the prime contractorship of Thales Alenia uh, Space in France and the instrument prime of OHB with Leonardo and, and, and Amos, um, we are looking at the moment at a launch Windows will use it before you ask me the question. I we hope for for about 2028. Um, there is besides uh, those. Uh, yeah, we have a, a three mirror anastic mat uh, combined with a with a uh, an often spectrometer, and you see here at the left the chime orbit and um, platform properties. Uh, we want to fly chime in a 632 kilometer orbit. Um, I already said that uh, we, are look, we are aiming for two spacecraft with a 1045 uh, equator nodal crossing time, um, uh, 7.5 years lifetime and consumable, which are guaranteed uh, for, for five years mission extension. Um, um, our, yeah, Luca was already uh, alluding to the massive data rate uh, that we are going to have to expect from those two chimes in orbit and um, just to anticipate this will be one of the challenges you say, which I would answer you when you ask me the question. One of the most important uh, points to mention here is international cooperation and our external, external framework. Uh, such a pro uh, project can only aspire to um, um, a good pickup by the user community 
if we are internationally working hand in hand. And that means not only the missions that have been launched so far, uh, like the Italian uh, PRISMA of the Italian Space Agency, ASI, or NMIP and DAISY is, is launched uh, by DLR, but we are particularly working very closely together um, with the surface biology geology mission SBG, who have a pretty similar launch schedule uh, such as CHIME has, and harmonization not only of our mission requirements, which we did in the forefield through joint workshops, through a joint cooperation group, which is meeting monthly online between uh, NASA and ESA. We are trying to align ourselves not only in terms of mission requirements, which are very similar to SPG and to CHIME, but also um, to, to, to the products. And um, we've been in this benefiting from this cooperation at the European side through the US Avaris uh, Next Generation Deployment in 2021, which is one of the last contracts I was able to run and hold at the agency be before I left. And of course, we have joint working groups on, on product harmonization, on retrievals and orbit simulation. Scientifically, um, the CHIME is supported by a mission advisory group. I mentioned those were also the ones that were at the beginning uh, casting the requirements in concrete. And we have a level two processes development study, which is also supporting uh, the scientific end of CHIME, as well as an end-to-end -end simulator, which is encompassing phase B2 until E, uh, run by a Spanish, German, and Italian team. And of course, I was just alluding to it, we have a campaign contract, uh, which is also producing data um, uh, to help and support uh, the user preparation. So uh, if you ask me, um, what's ESI going to do with it in the future? It's not been only at the beginning. We are at the moment contemplating um, a future activity at ESI in imaging spectroscopy. Um, and that's a proposal for an activity we are not having cast in concrete yet, but we want to do a forum on imaging spectrometer parameter space. That means, and point pointed to is what, what Rob already did, is we want to develop a strategy or a process on how to best handle source of disparity between imaging spectrometers um, and, and meaning accounting for sensor differences, where at the moment we have a zero term um, policy where any of the effects not accounted for of the system, of the instrument, or of the atmospheric correction, or of the solar irradiance profile are uh, in models are added to the uncertainty budget. And we are trying to also make sure, Rob pointed to that, that we are not trying to seek exactness where an approximation will do. So we're not trying to beat the system to be definitely better where a, a less accurate atmospheric correction would hamper us. And there we need a strategy to make sure that across the board, when we look at used harmonized data products for a larger user community, we are finding the right term uh, to define the uncertainties and to work with those disparities so that we have multi-sensor harmonized data products in the end that allow scaling, um, calibration and validation and data fusion. And with that, I'm coming to the end and I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you see, I think on very much all the time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. That was, uh, that was good. That was uh, like a whole view of uh, what is happening right now. Uh, I, I want you to give me at least three challenges for the expansion on China. Okay. Um, challenge number one, I think it was four and a half, uh, yeah, it was half a terabyte per orbit. And uh, what, what I think what Luca also pointed to, one of the challenge will be to prepare the user community at large. And when I look at all these screens with industry representatives, here I talk about the value adding industry in a hyperspectral. We need to make sure that the users are prepared and that industry is also prepared to be able to digest and work with these massive data sets in an expeditious way. This will not be easy. Um, a lot of it is being done already. And we have to make sure that, and this is challenge number one, that we convince users not to 
pull a, a red and near infrared from an imaging spectroscopy data set and make an NDVI out of it. So this is what we're trying to avoid. We want to get the panoply we want of information contained. Um, and it's not an underdetermined system like some multispectral systems are. It is a well-determined system because you cover the entire spectral range. And to make information to full, put it to full use, this is my big challenge number one. My challenge number two is what I just mentioned is to make sure that we are driving Calval not to absurdity, but that we have a very good process strategy to handle uh, disparities coming from the system, but also from all the other influences on our observations. And last but not least, to make um, data sets available, which are of global use for ecosystem ser services fused out of, should those sensors still fly and operate as we hope by the time CHIME and SBG go up, fused products out of Prisma, NMAP, EMIT, SBG, and CHIME, so that the user who doesn't necessarily want to know about the intricities of how those came about can have a global data set which gives them um, a good insight. I give you one example because I've been focusing on agriculture and terrestrial, but we've seen a great power in seeing methane leaks from imaging spectrometer data airborne as well as spaceborne. They've been shown with NMAP and Prisma. Make a global map of, of CH4 leaks. It's environmentally important, but we have to be able to harmonize those data sets first, to put it all together so that in a timely fashion, the user community has access to a well-instructed and how can I say quantitatively robust data product. So those are my three challenges. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So um, we have we have actually you, you were saying it, uh, my uh, about about the about the carbon emissions. So for carbon emission, you said you use uh, infrared, and uh, uh, but uh, also uh, is is a lot of um, interference in there. So how do you how do you will challenge that because it's, it's trying to put uh, uh, all all this space technology in there and this is a, a big translation uh, so uh, someone that can help actually with uh, because you mentioned before in your presentation you were looking for uh, wavelengths that are going from the cyan to the uh, cyan is uh, 500 nanometers to the uh, 2.5 millimeters so in the infrared. And I think uh, Nair can help out with that for an NKT. Yeah? Sure. So uh, I'll just share my screen. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And he hello, everybody. My name is Deepak Nair, and I'm a product line manager at NKT Photonics. Um, boom, boom. So, uh, I hope you can see the screen now. Yes, we can. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, so we we sell a uh, double a fan cell, of course, uh, super continuum lasers, which probably is a is a new kid in on the block uh, when it comes to illumination for hyperspectral imaging. Uh, these sources are extremely interesting because you can actually get uh, a very full visible to short wave infrared coverage from a single source. So that means. Uh, it can the light can be from 400 nanometers all the way to 2500 nanometers in a single collinear beam, uh, and these are lasers, of course. Uh, so they are diffraction limited. That means very high brightness, which makes them extremely ideal for uh, a push broom line scan uh, setup in a hyperspectral imaging system. Uh, in in nowadays we, with with all the energy prices rising, so it's uh, also time to consider. Uh, energy efficient sources. So even our uh, most powerful lasers only consume about less than 80 watts. And uh, if for most people who are working with uh, a multitude of uh, halogen based systems, we know that they burn for hundreds of kilowatts uh, if you need a high power system. Again, uh, 
these lasers generate extremely low uh, heat. So uh, you can actually use these for uh, heat sensitive samples uh, in hyperspectral imaging. And uh, again, as I told you, it's a laser. So uh, the M score is quite good. So you can have very flexible working distance with, a, with it because the beam is collimated and you can simply use a, a line generated lens uh, to, 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 to make a, a laser line to use in the push broom configuration. We also provide a, an extremely competitive total cost of ownership compared to uh, multiple halogen-based uh, illumination systems uh, and laser-driven light sources. And uh, supercontinuum lasers has been on the market for more than 20 years now. So we've been uh, able to demonstrate extremely long lifetimes uh, to tens of thousands of uh, hours. Okay. With that Thank you very much, uh, Deepak. This is this is great, but I still, why would these companies making high spectral imaging cameras care? Mm -hmm. Why do you offer with this light source that is that is unique? This is what we really need to understand. Exactly. So what we offer is actually a light source combined with some light delivery solutions. Uh, and since I, uh, it's 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 actually a laser, so we, we I'm not interested in illuminating an area. So what I'm interested in is in in going for point scan or line scan. Uh, systems. Uh, with, with that being said, uh, I, I see a lot of uh, participants in this meeting who are actually using extremely complicated optics, large area optics, handling broadband light. So these sources are also an excellent candidate if you want to have a light source to characterize uh, optical components like high performance mirrors or lenses, uh, which has to be efficient over a, a broad uh, wavelength range. Okay. Thank you very much for that. I don't expect us to solve this challenge today, but I would like mm -hmm. to understand which is, which were, which are the ideal sources for hyperspectral imaging. So I brought a few people in the room that had developed different light sources, and they are seeing that there could be opportunities for them in the segment. And one of the companies in the room is developing thermal sources. It's a startup that they joined Optica about half a year ago, and my good friend Ross Stanley is representing it. So 4K MEMS, <clears throat> you are developing thermal sources. Do you see an opportunity in hyperspectral imaging? Yes, of course. Uh, one of the things which um, people are often using in hyperspectral imaging, particularly for things like food processing, is halogen, as we just mentioned. Uh, it's a very nice source in the sphere region, but one of the issues is it produces a lot of heat yes. uh, and it's very wasteful. It's very difficult to get the light to exactly where you want it. So we've basically developed a MEMS thermal light source, which is basically like a MEMS tungsten bulb it's very very small it's very very intense and we can focus this light into basically where it's needed so we can do it with very very little waste light or waste heat at the same time and we can make them on smd mounts so we can put them into lines or put them into arrays so this is a very efficient way of getting um a swear light onto the region you want without for example melting cookies, which happens in, in some cases in, in food processing. One thing I want to ask one of the camera manufacturers in the room. We have uh, Alexander from Hinalea Imaging with us today. For those of you who don't know Hinalea Imaging, it is a very interesting company. You should know that this is one of the few companies actually combining different data sets spectral as well as imaging information from the object. Uh, from Hainale Assistant, could you tell us a bit, Alexander, what your company does and also what is the technology that you may need to the next steps? Absolutely. It's a very time, timely uh, uh, request uh, um, from us uh, for, for me because I actually do have an ask a very specific and challenging request for filter manufacturer. So uh, stay tuned. Um, so one of the things that we do is that uh, we're expanding the range of the spectral um, of the spectrum that we can address. So recently we started to move into the ultraviolet and this is for an industrial processing uh, monitoring uh, application. Uh, you may guess the industrial application, but of course UV is, of interest in many different uh, areas, including uh, space and uh, and airborne. Um, but uh, we 
primarily use a FabriPro um, variable etalon technology as the uh, wavelength selection mechanism, optical wavelength mechanism, and we're able to get um, a spectral resolution down to four nanometers, which wasn't possible uh, before with FabriPro, and, and we've covered the visible and IR range, the short wave infrared, so everything from 400 nanometers all the way up to 1,700, and, and now even up to 2,000 uh, nanometers. Um, recently going to UV, we're going down to about 200, 250 nanometers. Um, one of the challenges we have actually is finding a filter um, for that range because most filters are designed to cut that, that range out um, in imaging. So we're looking for a filter that actually includes that but cuts stuff above that. And that's really tricky, actually. You know, you would think that you could just find a blocking filter, like a hot, you know, a, kind of a hot filter that's just way down in the range in the visible. But <laughs> we've thrown it out to probably at this point, I would say almost half a dozen filter manufacturers. And they say, that's a very challenging problem. Um, so if, uh, if there's anyone out there that can give me something from about 250 to about 600 nanometers, um, I'd be very, very much in your debt. So that's my request. And um, as I said, we're uh, out there uh, with this really compact, very high-speed solution. It's like a framing-type bandpass uh, technology. So we're able to do things that uh, other hyperspectral imaging technologies can't do, such as real-time, you know, full-frame uh, classified hyperspectral images. So you can actually just run the camera like a regular camera, point it, and it'll be classifying the image in near real time. So there's my request. Who in the room can help with a 250 nanometer UV filter? Luckily, I, I have been working for many projects with ASML in the past. So I think, Alexander, I, I, I can definitely provide you with some ideas. We will do this offline. If anybody in the room can help, please write so in the chat or raise your hand and we can give you the floor now. But before that, uh, I saw in the roadmap of ESA, Luca, that you already mentioned in a couple of areas that the interest of UV. Could you highlight how is currently the, the solutions in UV-related hyperspectral imaging that are already available for ESA? What do you mean by uh, what are the solutions? In two, in two of your uh, areas, yeah, thought... you already specified UV. Is that already covered or are there challenges uh, for to be covered for UV-based hyperspectral yeah, imaging? They, they are already covered because Sentinel-4 is in the making and as well as Sentinel-5. Um, so the major challenge in the UV um, in spectroscopy, it is the control of, um, of uh, contamination um, and then also the low quantum efficiency of the detector we use and then uh, when we talk about this big beast control of contamination, it is really, really an issue there. So uh, control of contamination, stray light is, um, is important. You go to UV because you need ultra high spatial resolution. Um, no, 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 we go to UV because there is a plenty of information in UV when you do spectroscopy, especially for a meteorological application when you want to see uh, gases in uh, and in and then uh, uh, trace gases is very important in the UV. Yeah, there's plenty uh, of information in UV. Alexander, is this space uh, a market segment that you have been targeting? Because commonly we normally discuss about other application fields. It's uh, it's not space uh, in particular right now, but uh, this this is like I said, an industrial process application, but we see definitely possibilities for it to be used in airborne and space, yeah. Thanks very much for that. And you know, in my constant travels, I I went to pick international conference last week and there I, I got in touch with ST Microelectronics. They were there because they were also participating in another conference called Compound Semiconductor. There I met Jonathan Steckel and we talk and we talk about quantum dots for shortwave infrared imaging. And Jonathan, who is now in the outdoors enjoying beautiful blue sky, he said, I would like to join the meeting and tell people what we are doing in the quantum dots uh, field and see how we could actually help the hyperspectral imaging sector. Jonathan, I don't know if we can hear you well. We can yeah. see you like you were here next yeah. to us. 
Okay, great. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Loud and clear. All right, excellent. Yeah. So at ST, we've um, we've developed a technology on 300 millimeter uh, CMOS uh, silicon wafers that essentially allows us to manufacture at large volume um, SWIR uh, image sensors. And so we've uh, we've been working hard to um, get this technology scaled up and in, in into commercial products. Um, and the sensor itself is a, a CMOS-based image sensor that uses lead sulfide-based quantum dot technology. So the quantum dot materials is a thin film of, of nanoparticles made from lead sulfide semiconductor that uh, absorbs light and creates photocurrent. And we put that on top of a, a CMOS readout circuit. And uh, we're making 2.2 micron pixel pitch, 2.3 megapixel uh, image sensors that um, essentially can absorb light from uh, 1.45 microns, so 1,450 nanometers, and blue of that. So you can absorb all the way into uh, the near IR, the visible, and the UV. And you can put different filters onto this image sensor technology and do uh, multispectral, hyperspectral uh, spectrometry. Uh, you can do um, lots of other uh, sensing modalities uh, with this technology. Um, and the area that we've been focusing mainly has been on shortwave infrared uh, image sensing. Um, and a lot of our focus is on uh, more high volume um, applications and use case scenarios like consumer electronics. Um, we don't spend too much time and effort speaking with people about applications where the volumes are low, uh, such as uh, you know machine, machine vision, and space, defense, and, and those types of um, application spaces. So if there is an interest to take a lot of these, you know, spectrometry uh, and hyperspectral and, and multispectral image sensor technologies and, and move them into more, more large volume, more focused on miniaturization and consumer electronic focused use case scenarios, um, we'd be excited to talk to you guys about it. When it comes to detectors for hyperspectral imaging, one of the things that we're always worried about is the, is the cooling. So can we work with cooled and uncooled? I'm sharing this uh, this screen because I think it was last year, Tron, please correct me if I'm wrong, it was last year at Photonics West or maybe a bit earlier, the high specs uh, launched a camera based on, on Mercury, Mercury Camion Telarite technology uh, for... Um, for hyperspectral imaging, it's an s weird shortwave infrared sensor, but it has to be cool 150K. Stephen, can you comment on the on the cooling? Uh, could we make a shortwave infrared camera based on quantum dots operating completely uncooled? Stephen? Yeah, yeah I mean, we are... Our, our, ah, sorry, our Jonathan, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 no worries, no worries, no worries. Yeah, our, our technology, it's, um, it's a thin film semiconductor photo detector stack and it's uh it doesn't require any cooling uh, we don't do any cooling they're they're built and designed to, to to operate at room temperature uh the one thing that we've done is we've really optimized them for um you know for use case in in, in consumer electronics so as a result you know if you want to uh have them operate uh for long lifetime at high temperature like over 100 degrees celsius um then we would need to uh continue to, to develop them and, 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 and improve them further. But the current technology uh, works really well um, up to uh, 70 degrees C, uh, accelerated aging, and at room temperature operation, and no cooling is required. So, yeah. Wrong. It's been about one year and a half, more or less, right, since you released this camera, or two years. What was the, 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 the market uptake of the camera, and what are the next challenges you see for your shortwave infrared imaging camera for hyperspectral trend? Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> we haven't really, you know, we've been working on scaling the technology up and, and, and it's been on 300 millimeter um, for a while now. And it's, it's ready to move into mass production um, towards the end of this year, early, early next year. And uh, we've really been focusing more on, on high volume consumer electronic applications and use case scenarios and getting it into products um, along those lines. And, and, and the key challenges there are really, I think, <clears throat> getting the technology into people's hands, having companies and 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 uh, application engineers look at look at have have this technology in hand figure out what they can do with it what what's useful um, what it can do what it can't do um, how they could potentially use it and then drive it uh, into products and, and into the future and I think what's what's unique now is that it's it's a, a, a low dark current room temperature operation uh, high resolution uh, shortwave infrared image sensor that has a cost similar to what you would uh, pay for 
a silicon-based global shutter, a rolling shutter image sensor. So the paradigm shift here is, I don't think anyone's ever had the opportunity to put a shortwave infrared high resolution image sensor into, into any product at a cost of silicon image sensing. And so as a result, it takes time to pe pe for everyone in the world to figure out how to use the technology, what it's useful for, what, what is shortwave infrared image sensing do that you can't do with visible and 940 nanometer image sensing? And then what's the value proposition? How can it be used? Where will it be used? And that's gonna take some time for people to <clears throat> develop that and put it into products and, and know that it's available. And so I think that's part of what we're letting people know is for the first time is it's available. And uh, we'd, be, we'd be excited to you know, give you uh, an evaluation kit, allow you to start using it and figure out how potentially you could use it. Evaluation kit coming from ST Microelectronics. If anybody wants to use it, for those of you watching here and watching YouTube, I cover the shipping expenses and I will not claim the receipt. I want you to try <laughs> the uh, quantum dust technology of ST Microelectronics. And it's serious. I will cover the shipping expenses. I will pay for it. Nice. And nice. I want to Thank give you. the floor now to, because you just mentioned scaling up reaching volume production. We have organized a lot of activities on hyperspectral imaging at Optica, always with a person that means the world to me in hyperspectral on the room. Wouter, Charles, I wanted you to take the role of closing the meeting the way that we deserve. Tell us how, what is the status of the hyperspectral imaging activity at IMEC? And most important, tell us how the people here in the room can help you. The floor and the attention of everyone is yours. What a, what a great honor, Jose. Uh, so great to be here. Uh, thanks for giving me the floor and, and uh, this opportunity. Um, so I'm Motor Program Manager of IMEX Spectral Imaging Activities. Uh, and indeed, we have developed a technology, the filter technology to, to mass manufacture, let's say, um, uh, spectral imaging devices. Uh, in, in this slide here, uh, this gives an ID. So we are processing on wafer level and patterning filters down to the single pixel level, making many uh, structures uh, on, on the individual pixels. And that comes with a lot of uh, new possibilities, of course. So basically we are um, replacing uh, all the optical elements that normally go between a focusing objective and a detector uh, by some filter architecture, uh, could be um, just simple uh, thin film filters or fabri Peru or multiple stacks of fabri Peru or anything you can think of, um, putting that di directly on the chip. And um, maybe this, this image sometimes gives a wrong impression. We don't intend to replace push broom or any other spectral imaging systems that uh, we we think every type of, of implementation of spectral imaging technology has its own application and field. But what's, what makes it really unique is that we, we can, so we can easily scale, but from when there is a volume value fit, like for space uh, on a large area detector, uh, or like the one that we have done CMV12K for Kim, um, we can easily make a series of these detectors to build constellations. So today our customers are bringing our technology in space. Um, there are constellations of, of 55 plus satellites, uh, up to 100 satellites in space being built today. Um, and that this is possible because we, we, can, we can massively serialize this production. Uh, so we, for us, it's really difficult to make one off. Um, but once we make one lot of, of imagers, we, we immediately have um, a few tens to hundreds of them. Um, and, and especially for space, I think what is interesting is that it's uh, typically a monolithic integration of the filters on a detector, um, uh, making it also a very miniaturized and robust system because everything is integrated in the detector. So once you, you, you manufacture it, you characterize it in, in the lab on, on, on our planet, on, on the ground, then after launching, the detector will behave mainly the same. Um, so making, making the integration and, and also system design much easier. Um, and so uh, we are bringing this to market. Our goal is to, to, to innovate and change the world a bit with this technology and um, as being a technology provider, we are looking to find the sweet spots of this specific technology in the market. Um, so if you have ideas and uh, if, you, if you have a need for this technology, we are very happy to discuss with, with anyone. 
Uh, we also engage to, to explore the market in partnering with camera companies, with system companies. We did our own system design and we are, as a research institute, very open to share our insights in system design uh, and how our technology can help you innovate. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, to discuss and, and, um, and to collaborate. Both in this meeting, you have seen that we have identified a sweet spot for the wavelength range uh, from 500 nanometer, even though Genalea was talking about 220 to 50, all the way to 2.5 microns, even though Nireos was talking all the way to 8 to 14 microns. What is the ideal wavelength range, uh, not just the band, but the wavelength range that you want to target and who could help you extend it? So today, on, on if we are processing on CMOS, of course, we're 400 to 1000 nanometers. Uh, in that range, we see a lot of um, interesting application in near infrared, especially. Um, but we're not limited to CMOS. We can also process on, on other substrates and then integrate um, on, on uh, uh, in gas or MCT detectors, so going up to 2.5 micron. Um, this is being done today, so where constellations and payloads are being made to cover 400 to 2.5 micron. Um, UV is also possible uh, to manufacture, and there um, we are also sometimes working together with, with, um, uh, with, with optical filter companies to, to build butcher, butcher block uh, filters that we can then help integrating on, on sensors. So we built up a lot of experience and know-how on, on the full sensor uh, integration. So anything that we can help on, on that uh, regard as well, we can uh, we can uh, supply information and know-how. Okay, so I don't know if this answers the question. Yes, you've done a fantastic job on, on this over the last years. We really want to see the next step. And I'm amazed how you're working with camera manufacturers. So just one quick thing, when, when are we gonna see the first camera-based product in consumer electronics? based on hyperspectral imaging. When we're going to have hyperspectral imaging in our mobile phone? Uh, so yeah, we have spectricity that is bringing this really to, to the masses. And uh, they are doing a, a very good job. They are making good progress. And I, I think there will very soon be a, a release coming. Um, but a lot, of, a lot is happening behind the scenes. So soon it will come. There's a lot of happening behind the scenes. I'm so happy that this is going to be on the scenes. And remember, iMac and everyone, we have a product release uh, event coming in the coming years. We want to help our members release their products. So we want to help Spectricity and iMac on this fantastic release. We are about to close the meeting. But before we do that, today we had different space agencies worldwide in the room. We also had the Canadian Space Agency in the room. And I would like to give the floor to Shen. Shen Enkian is here with us to tell us a bit about what you're working on and who from the room, and we remember we talk about the optics, the laser the detector, who from the room could help you? The floor is yours, Shen. Okay, thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, uh, Optica to organize this amazing uh, forum. Uh, called the industry, uh, you know, uh, forum for uh, image spectrometer. So I was planned, you know, because I'm a government uh, officer, I was planned just uh, to listen and to learn, collect information, then we'll share with my colleague at the agency and maybe our Canadian industry. But uh, <clears throat> since this uh, forum was so informative, and uh, so uh, Jose also thank you. So give me a chance to uh, last. So first, I want to you know <clears throat> say this is really a very good opportunity. I saw many of you know our international uh, agency uh, colleagues, uh, Rika and uh, Michael from the UESA, and also uh, Oda from the DLOI, and also my friend Rob from NASA uh, JPL. So this is really very amazing. So many. Uh, agency people also interested and uh, present and learned. So I'm here, you know, since I'm a, a principal scientist at Canadian Space Agency for almost uh, 30 years now. I'm the technical lead of Canadian hyperspectral uh, technology. Actually, at the agency, uh, I uh, participated and witnessed all the development of our Canadian hyperspectral mission. And uh, since I said I was not planned to make a presentation, so I just want to you know, show you, I made a uh, presentation 
one and a half year ago to our Canadian, uh, we have uh, used, we call it our Canadian High Perspective Working Group. And uh, they invited me to, so I don't know, have you seen this? Share yep. the thing. Yes. And uh, that was the presentation I was asked when this, our Canadian High Perspective Working Group performed. So ask me to make the first presentation to them. And actually this uh, was a 30 minute presentation I will not uh, do here. I just want to use, I want to show you, I do have something. And uh, <clears throat> so, um, so I probably also want to very briefly to tell you something, you know, what happened in Canada for the last 30 years. And uh, Canada actually, we uh, started our, uh, hyperspectral development very earlier. And uh, we almost at the same time, like in you know, our Italian space agency for the plasma and also in you know, our German space agency for the MMAP. Our mission at that time was called the HERO, but there are so many other reasons and the political reason and the government change, but our mission was not to uh, fly. And uh, later on, we initiated a, a few, you know, follow up and uh, for many reasons, and uh, we didn't get a mission launch, but in Canada, we do have very strong, you know, technology capability. And for example, we have our industry, you know, they made this airborne high perspective instrument in the early, you know, uh, 1980s. And this is called Cassie. This is the company in Calgary. And thank also, you. thank you very thank much, Shenang. In the next meeting, we are going to start with you. Thank you very much, Shenang, and thank you very much, everyone. The most important part of this meeting, the most important part of this meeting is that you need to get in touch with each other. So now is when the meeting finishes and the most important part starts. Please let us know with whom would you like to get in touch, which company in the room could have helped you with one of your challenges, whether it is one of the space agencies, whether it is one of the RD centers, whether it's one of the companies making coatings, laser detectors, or one of the camera manufacturers that we have in the room. Our goal is to connect people. Thank you very much, everyone, for two hours of your time. They meant the world to us. Until the next time, this was Optica, Helena Diaz and Jose Pozo. Please be in touch with us. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right, so now we cut the stream, we cut the YouTube stream.